Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next EDW session titled Securing Your Data Assets Against Hackers, which will be presented by Seth Nielsen, the founder and chief scientist of Crimson Vista Inc. All audience members are muted during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A window on the right of the screen, and our speaker will respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. Please note that there's a linked form at the bottom of the page titled EDW Conference Session Survey. This is where you can submit session feedback, and we encourage you to do so. So let's begin our presentation now. Thank you and welcome, Seth. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, obviously, I'm sure you hear this from everyone, but we all wish we could meet in person. Uh, truthfully, I, I <laughs> not my favorite kind of teaching style. I prefer to be with people and able to move around and engage with people. Um, I, I teach classes at the university level where I have to um, I have to teach using this method as well. So it's not that I don't use it, just wish we had other options to meet in person. With that said, um, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, so uh, you can kind of see where I'm coming from. Um, I am uh, a consultant. I, I work with people on matters of computer security. I have a bachelor's and master's degree from Brigham Young University and a PhD in computer science from Rice. Uh, on a more personal note, because I think sometimes that, uh, I think that's useful just to kind of, we all know a little bit about each other. Um, I have five really great kids. I love Jane Austen novels and movies. And I've written, but not published, a fantasy novel, just so you can kind of get a little bit of a view into my head. Um, let me also say uh, just a little bit about the type of computer security that I do, um, because this will also clue in to what I'm really going to focus on in the presentation. Uh, a lot of times when I interact with a client, one of their first questions is, well, okay, we'd like you to do some penetration testing. Uh, penetration testing is not what I do. Penetration testing is a very, very narrow, specific part of computer security. I do a broader computer security effort that you could call cybersecurity engineering, which is we start with the big picture, we figure out what our needs are, we figure out what our real issues are, what we need to protect, why and how. And that's gonna figure in pretty prominently into today's conversations. And I think this will actually be really useful for you as most of you are attending this conference focused on data and your interests are in data. And data, as we're going to see, should really be driving your organization's security planning. Data should be driving your organization's security planning. Again, I said I'd tell you just a little bit about the type of projects I've worked on to put this into reference. I have worked on a really wide range. I've worked on things from medical devices, medical devices that were being um, infiltrated from long distance. So you're at the hospital, you think the device is giving you one treatment, but maybe it's being interfered with. Um, I have worked on um, systems related to banks. And by the way, at this bank I was working with, it was a data issue. They were not bringing me in to analyze how the intruders got in. There had been another team that did that. They'd already locked it down. They'd already secured the breach. My analysis was on the data. Uh, how important was the data? What could an attacker do with it? Um, I have worked on uh, projects related to ransomware. I've worked on projects related to secret codes. I've worked on um, uh, projects related to phishing attacks. And I emphasize this breadth again to emphasize that the way I think about security and what I think is most important 
is understanding these big picture issues, understanding motivations, understanding value, uh, and, and understanding organizational goals. So today, we're really going to talk about how data drives important decisions and, and planning and understanding for computer security. So even if none of you are very familiar with computer security, my hope, my goal, is that you go back to your organizations, you find your security team, and you say, you should be talking with me if you're not already. If your security team is not integrated with you who are in charge of data or, or involved in the collection of data or the management of data, there is already a problem. I don't know where it is, but it's already there. And today, I'm going to try and talk with you about what, how you think about data in a security context so that you can go back to your group and, um, and insert yourself where it's appropriate. Uh, now, you may have noticed if you've looked at the slides, if you pulled them down, I have uh, 160 or so. We are obviously not going through all of those today. Um, I've left these in from previous presentations where it was full day because I think the slides are good and there may be information in there that you can read it and if you don't fully understand it, it'll at least tell you where to Google. So we're going to actually skip to the end of my slide deck, which is where we hit the punch lines, but I've provided the whole slide deck to you uh, because I believe it could be helpful. But with that in mind, we're going to jump all the way down to slide number 119, where we really get in to the punchline of all of the presentation. I want to credit right from the start, if you're looking at my video camera, I am a big fan of Danette McGilvray's book, uh, Executing Data Quality Projects. She now has a second edition out, which I need to get. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, I am related to her by marriage, um, but uh, I read her book and it was eye-opening to me as a security individual. It changed how I think about computer security. So as you'll see here in my slides, I'm going to quote from her just a little bit. And I wanna start by talking about data governance, which I do not claim to be an expert in. Some of you maybe know more about it than I do, but I'm going to introduce you to how I see it as a security person. So here's a quote um, that is, data governance is the organization and implementation of policies, procedures, structures, roles, and responsibilities that outline and enforce rules of engagement, decision rights, and accountabilities for the effective management of information assets. I will admit to you that I was probably this guy leaning back in the chair at one point and thinking to myself, what does this have to do with security or privacy? Well, I had a really deep realization that you can't secure data, you can't govern. Okay, I'm gonna repeat that because this is so important. I feel like I should make t-shirts or put it on mugs. You can't secure data, you can't govern. And on the flip side, you can't govern data, you can't secure. Okay, so this topic, super important. So let's talk about access controls. I have slides about this earlier, but for now, let me just simplify it down to, it just enforces access. I mean, it's, it's kind of a circular definition, uh, but the idea is anything you have that attempts to control access to data, whether it's physical, like a locked room, or digital, like a password, is a type of access control. So with access controls, here's an example of a digital control, uh, maybe a program that only lets user one here access sales data and not payroll data. That would be an access control. 
or a locked room. You may have heard of role-based access controls. These are very popular right now. The idea is instead of giving one user a set of permissions, you give a role a set of permissions and then you assign a user to one, but often multiple roles. By the way, if you wonder why I'm using names like Alice and Bob for my characters here, it's actually a little joke from computer security. We usually talk about party A as Alice and party B as Bob. So a little inside humor for you. Here we have Bob leaning back in his chair. Bob is, has a role as an administrator, an analyst, and in data entry, okay? And then depending on which role Bob uses to log into the system, Bob gets access to different databases, different applications, et cetera. This slide is hinting at one of the problems that often shows up in role-based access control. If any of you have worked long enough in an organization, you have often found that you get role creep. Meaning, you started out in a role. Bob here started out in data entry, having very little to do with anything else. Bob gets promoted to analyst, but as many of you are probably aware, do they ever stop having Bob do some amount of data entry or being involved in the data entry? Or at least, well, Bob, we know you've moved on, but uh, somebody who's in your role now has a question. Can you come show them how to do it? And because of problems like this, a lot of times people don't get their roles that they're out of removed. And this is a security problem because they're only supposed to have access to the information and processes that are appropriate for their role. Are you seeing why data governance is important in this? So here's my point. Governance is about the outline and enforcement of rules of engagement. If those are weak, it doesn't matter how good your security software is. It doesn't matter how strong the encryption is. It doesn't matter if they release a new security patch you will have security issues because the business rules about who can access data and how are weak. So one place for you to look to insert yourself in with the security team. Is the security team clear on who accesses data? If they're not, their security rules are wrong somewhere. Okay, let's talk about privacy. And again, I have a series of slides on PII or personally identifiable information. Sometimes it's a good policy to restrict PII to a single database and you kind of mark it as a very critical database. But again, that's no good if you have no idea who can access the database. All right, what about things like accountability, which is also part of data governance? I think most of you have probably either been a part of or been aware of an organization where accountability was not clearly defined. Audits, for example, are very valuable to computer security. Audits are very important for computer security. However, without accountability, what's going to happen to the audits? Suppose an audit reveals that PII was retained incorrectly. Yeah, okay, we need to follow the law. We have to disclose, we have to do this, we have to do that. But if no one was accountable, if there were no accountabilities for the, the um, the allocation of the data, the access of the data, the, the responsibility for um, the, 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 the use, 
then any of the audits won't actually have much of an impact on making sure it doesn't happen in the future. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk to you about a technical concept. Um, this may or may not be something you need to be super involved in, but because it's data related, I'm gonna share it with you. One of the most important problems with uh, secret codes, cryptography or encryption, is what you do with the keys. It turns out there is supposed to be an entire key life cycle. A key, a key is the thing if you're not familiar, and again, we couldn't go through all those details today, but a key is like, um, it's usually a, a, a number, I mean, it's, it's usually a small amount of data, maybe 128 bits, that's 16 bytes, or 32 bytes, Certain keys are a little bit longer, maybe a few thousand bytes, but these keys control your ability to encrypt data, decrypt data, do digital signatures, some of these kind of things. Keys have a life cycle. They have an amount of time for which they should be active, then there should be a certain amount of time where they're suspended, not used further except for data that still um, requires them, and then eventually deactivated. There should be a process for if they are compromised. This is always the hardest part of cryptography. For those of you who are responsible for data in your organization, you might want to integrate with your security team to make sure that the data related to keys is properly accounted for and managed. If your organization does not have good management of keys, there is a security problem. I don't know where, but it's there. Keys must be managed, and this is often a place of weakness. And this is a, another example of a place where um, data architects, uh, uh, data users, data managers should be involved. Okay, um, we're going to move on. Uh, this is kind of uh, wrapping up what I was saying. If you, a, a key is tied to decision rights often. If you don't know who should have a key for how long or for what purpose, no key management. Okay. Now we're going to switch. We've been kind of focused on the people, right? Our governance so far, I've kind of been focusing in on people, but now I want to talk about the data itself. Okay, if you're talking about PII, suppose your organization is doing an audit to see if personally identifiable information is being adequately protected according to GDPR or the California privacy law or any of those. You probably need to be sure that you know that the PII is only coming in from authorized entry points, okay? Not every, not every data entry point should be a place where PII can be admitted. But this relies on a very important assumption that most organizations think they know, but often don't. And that is, do you know all of your data entry points? Do you know all of your data entry points? Do you know where the data is created and coming from? If you don't, then you can't be certain that your PII is only coming in from authorized entry points. Um, this again, I drew this quite a bit from um, Danette McGilvray's book. Do you know where the data is in your system? And I mean the entire business system. Do you know if you have duplication, the sources of a given piece of data, how it is shared, and how it is disposed of. 
You can't secure what you don't know. Now, let me tell you a story of a company I worked with. This company um, was responsible for handling some private data. And they said, we are handling all of our private data. It is encrypted. It is this. It is that. Well, it turned out that a more deep and detailed audit found that they had what is called a caching server. If you're not familiar with a caching server, the idea is that um, you might have a big database that for whatever reason is somewhat slow on its accesses. Maybe maybe because of where it is in the cloud, or maybe because of certain characteristics, uh, it, it, it isn't highly performant. There are certain types of in-between devices that as the data is coming out of the database and being routed to a client, a, 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 a computer that, that is using it, data gets cached. And that way, if the user asks for the same piece of data again a few minutes later, you don't go all the way back to the database to get the answer. Well, it turned out they had a caching system that was caching data for 90 days unencrypted. And there was a large amount of PII on this system that was unencrypted. The organization was largely unaware that that caching even existed. Didn't even know it was there. This is what I'm driving at. Do you know where the data is in your system? Do you know if you have any duplication? Do you know all the sources of a given piece of data? Without this information, you can't secure it because you can't secure what you don't know. Now, this is um, another quote from McGillbray that I really like and believe is very important. Information quality. It is the degree to which information and data can be a trusted source for all required users. It is having the right set of correct information at the right time in the right place for the right people. And I bet even before you read what Alice says here at the bottom of my slide, you could see where I was going with this. An organization with low data quality will almost certainly have poor data security and privacy. An organization with low data quality will almost certainly have poor data security and privacy. Because if you don't have the right set of information or it's not in the right time or in the right place, I promise you it isn't being secured correctly. Now, this is a quote that comes from one of my security books that I actually think was meant to be married with this quote on information security. This is a book that I use in all of my classes when I teach, and I've taught classes at Johns Hopkins University, and currently I teach at the University of Texas at Austin. And I try and drive this concept into my students' head. Many systems fail because their designers protect the wrong things or protect the right things, but in the wrong way. Now, if you think about this, we can combine this with our information security quote. So, I'm sorry, information quality quote, and I give you my version. Many systems fail because their designers protect the wrong data or protect the right data, but in the wrong way, at least in part because they don't know what data they have, how correct it is, where it came from, and what it's used for. So that, I'm, I, I'm quoting myself now. That's really exciting. I like that quote. Um, okay, so where do we go with this? Well, 
I really like uh, Danette's book. I think Danette McGilbray's book, The 10 Steps to Quality Data and Trusted Information is a great place to start on the data quality end. Because, uh, and if, I, if I'm repeating myself, it's because I'm really, really into this concept that you have to know your data in order to secure it. So uh, Danette also has an acronym. Now she uses this for information in general, but, but for information lifecycle, but I'm going to adapt this for security. It's called POSMAD. So she says in the information lifecycle, there is planning for data, obtaining data, storing and sharing data, maintaining data, applying data, and disposing of data. I'm taking her formulation here, and we're going to adapt it just a little bit for um, security and privacy. Okay, here we go. How does planning for data tie in to security and privacy? I hope these are all useful pieces of information that you can take back to your organization. Even if you're like, I don't know the first thing about cryptography, I don't know the first thing about data security, this is where you can absolutely make a massive difference in your organization. Start by helping your organization identify your data security and privacy requirements. You may know better than anybody in your organization exactly what those should be. And if you don't, you may be the most qualified person to help them figure it out. If anybody in the room as you're doing this says, oh, so what kind of encryption should we use? Stop them immediately. This is not what we're talking about. Rather, what we are really talking about are what are the requirements? Who is allowed to view it? How, under what conditions are they allowed to view it? What do we have to do for chain of custody? What are the disposal rules? Um, uh, who will have access to the data? Is it going to require keys? Uh, how will the keys be managed? Are there regulatory and ethical obligations? This is what uh, needs to happen in order to plan for the security and privacy of your data. Okay? Once we have a plan in place, then we need to talk about obtaining it. This is also important because in security, we often say that it is at the boundaries where things go wrong. So you might think about this in terms of a house. Most of your uh, uh, would-be burglars are not Harry Potter-like wizards that can operate inside your house. Most of them will need to use a door or a window and not a wall. But there's another reason why boundaries are, are important. And that is the transition. There is, there, is, there is usually some change in the state of the data involved in the transmission. And security is sometimes a part of that. So securely collecting data usually comes in one of two ways, either already secured or, uh, or um, it has to be secured as it's coming in. So the biggest problem, and this is what I was driving at earlier with this transition, is security context. Context is everything in security. And what might be secure in one context may not be secure in another. And so understanding how you obtain data and how the security requirements may change from one boundary to another are critical. Let's do an example. Although I didn't have time to talk about PII today, there is a concept called linkable PII. Some data may not be considered personally identifiable information when it is by itself. 
but it becomes PII when it is um, with other data that can be linked. And through the linking, you can identify the individual. So you can imagine that there is a piece of data that in our external secure boundary was, uh, was secure, it was fine, it was not PII. But it comes into our boundary and all of a sudden, because we're collecting data from multiple sources, it becomes PII. My point is, what was sufficient for protecting it externally is not sufficient for protecting it internally. So as part of the obtaining process, you need to be aware of those changes from security requirements. Once again, you may be the most qualified person in your organization to help the security team figure out what those requirements are and where these kind of context changes happen, right? Once we obtain the data, then we get into what is kind of your classic security, I guess. You know, we need to, in, we need to store it safely in a file cabinet or something. So once you get data in the system, you have to control where it is and who has access to it. Ensure that all locations where the data is stored are known. Ensure that equivalent security controls are used in all locations. This is another example of where data governance and data quality are so important. Uh, one of the things that you all know from duplication, right? You, you, you can get mismatching information or you can have various reasons why if the same information is coming from multiple sources, that's a, that's a data quality problem. Well, um, same thing with security. If you have data that over in server A is protected with 2FA, two-factor authentication, but a copy of it is available over on server B without two-factor authentication, you're in trouble. I'll tell you another true story that happened just a few months ago. I was working with an organization where somebody had intruded into their system and stolen a bunch of passwords. It turns out that 90 some percent of their users had 2FA, two-factor authentication, and there were a few that didn't. Well, who do the attackers attack? The strong or the weak? And I don't mean that the person was weak, I simply mean that the security control was weak. They always attack the weak. So the way to look at this is not to say, well, 95% of our users use 2FA, so we're secure. Nope, it doesn't work that way. If 5% of your users are using weaker security than 95% of your security, it all lowers down to the lowest common denominator. This is a mistake companies make all the time. We're doing great. We have 95% of everybody using two-factor authentication. No, nope, you're not done. Sorry. The attackers will get the 5% who don't have it. This is not random chance. It's not like there was some stray bullet. This is dedicated, determined. They wake up and do their nine to five job trying to get into your organization. They aren't going to use the 95% who have 2FA involved. They'll use the 5% without it. So again, data governance. Do you know all of your users? Do you know all of their security procedures? Uh, are we keeping it uniform across the organization? Do we have some back doors? Well, they're just a contractor. The contractor doesn't have to have the same. No, 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 no. Can't do that. For data that has to be secured, you have to make sure that all access has the same security level. Used role-based access controls like we talked about, but manage the roles and get rid of roles that are no longer in use. Maintain data. 
This is kind of going back to making sure those roles are still in use. If you've heard of data decay, we're going to talk about security decay. Data decay, of course, is where um, as the data sits there, it might become less relevant or it might be out of date um, or for whatever reason, it's no longer accurate. That same type of decay also happens with security. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but the role change is an example, right? Um, somebody is in role A, then they get promoted to role B, and they're left with their access to role A. That is a security vulnerability. Staff turnover, a uh, person comes in, they get a, a password, they get access, and they're fired three weeks later and nobody remembers to disable their access. So we have to maintain the security of our data by watching for sources of decay. Uh, as a quick note, if you remember the Equifax breach, they didn't patch a server they knew was vulnerable. That's security decay. All right, applying the data, we're not going to talk about too much here as we're running short on time. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm just gonna say what I say here, which is, it's a microcosm of the other elements. As you go to use the data, there is its own kind of little mini internal POSMAD cycle. Um, within your own organization, you may have to have plan for how it's used in case there are security rules. There may be changes in the security context so that moving it from where it's stored to where it's um, actually applied requires um, uh, careful management, and when you're all done using it, you may need to dispose of it from that location. So uh, pause mad, you could kind of reduce it down to how that's being done when the data is actually being used and computed. But finally, what we're gonna talk about last here is dispose of data. Please dispose of your data. It is important for computer security. Now, some think of data disposal as, I took a hard drive and I had the hard drive shredded. That's one type of disposal, that's media disposal. More holistically, you need to account for security issues like, has all access been revoked? We need to destroy data. If you think about it, access information is data, right? Somebody's access to a system is a piece of data that data needs to be destroyed when they should no longer have access. Here's another one. Remember how I mentioned that caching server? Sometimes you'll find there are pieces of software or hardware that even when you think you've destroyed a copy of the data, the data is still being used by it and a copy still exists. Uh, what about remote device usage? Uh, what about, and of course, the physical we talked about, destroying the hard drive. If it's data that needs to be deleted securely, you should use something called cryptographic shredding or overwriting. If you don't know what that is, your, your security team should. But you, as the data experts, uh, need to take the lead on which data should be securely deleted. Document the destruction if required by policy or regulation. Um, release keys, access controls, et cetera, associated with the data, and also look around for metadata. You may need to, if you've got a secure piece of data and you delete it, there may be metadata that could be used to recreate all or part of the secure data that was supposed to be destroyed. Okay, um, lastly, just as my last kind of slide here or two, information quality is, I believe, critical. And I haven't even really addressed that at all. I really just talked about the POSMAD cycle for how you should think about securing your data. We obviously can't talk about it today, but um, there are a lot of great resources on it. Again, encourage your organizations to have good information quality so they can also have good data security and privacy. Okay, um, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of my pitch 
for this first part of the presentation. I guess we have uh, 10 minutes left. I'm happy to take a Q and A for the 10 minutes. Uh, if you want to reference a slide in your question, feel free and we can jump back to it, or we can just talk about any questions you might have about security or data security and privacy. Yeah, that's great. Um, we don't have any questions just yet, but um, oh, we just had one come in from Mark, so uh, keep an eye out for that in just one second. Sure. Um, good question. Um, so I haven't spent a lot of time investigating those, those other models for the access control, so I can't give you a good answer right now. Um, if you want to uh, follow up with me afterwards, I could, uh, I could do a little more investigation and answer that. Um, Zero trust is a really interesting concept. Um, zero trust actually is kind of going in all kinds of directions right now. And it's probably going to, um, it's probably going to be the way things go in the future one way or another. I'm a little bit more familiar with zero trust from the perspective of how do we um, create a network that is secure. Uh, zero trust as it's used, for example, uh, like with Google's Beyond Corp, where it doesn't matter if you are inside the building or connecting remotely, it is the same level of security. And they check both that it's you, right? They check both that... It, that you have your username, password, two-factor authentication. They also make sure it's a machine that they trust with a certificate. And then uh, the machine also has to go through a certain kind of um, policy check to make sure that it's up on its patches, its operating system, whatever else. And then there's actually a database that only lets the machine talk to servers and processes for which that user and that machine are jointly authorized. Um, there are a lot of reasons that we are switching to this kind of a model. Um, a lot of people feel like perimeter security, if you're familiar with that, for networks, is, is dead. And, um, and that it was never really good enough to begin with. The problem that, that people are finding in zero trust is the classic problem in security usability trade-offs. Uh, some people think that uh, at least that type of beyond court model for zero trust is um, too fragile. Um, I, I know some people have really struggled to feel like it's, it's useful and then sometimes the the quality of that security degrades because you just find workarounds. Um, but uh, it seems pretty, it seems like there's a lot of consensus around the idea that zero trust models are, are the thing of the future and that um, perimeter models are not. I'm not sure if that answers your question on the zero trust side. Um, feel free to ask a follow-up, uh, see if we're talking about the same, the same part of that. Um, I, I've also not paid a lot of attention yet to uh, this other authorization pattern, but um, again, if you want to sync up with me offline, uh, I can look into it and, and give you some thoughts about it. Uh, again, kind of the, the approach that I'll typically take with a, a, a client is to start at the high level and then work down to these kind of specificities. Um, for tools related to collecting the attributes and metadata, that is not actually my area of expertise. That would probably be more for uh, the data people, which is kind of my point. Like, this is why I feel like a lot of organizations are really struggling with their security 
is I feel like there are a lot of walls that go up between the security people and the, and the data people. So that would probably be a good conversation to have between the security team and the data team. I feel bad because I'm not giving you uh, answers to the specifics you're looking for um, on, 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 those, on those topics directly. But um, uh, again, if you'd like to discuss it further afterwards, we could dig in and go into some more detail together if you'd like. And uh, do you have your contact information on the last slide? Is that what the uh, final slide is? Um, yes, there you go. Let's go ahead and pop that up so that they can see it. Um, and then uh, while we wait for maybe a couple other questions to come in, um, what's uh, if you had to distill it down and say, what's the one main takeaway that um, you would like for the audience to walk away with? Information quality is necessary for data security. And if you are involved in data, you should be involved with the security team. And then what do you think, and this may be sort of the reverse of the same answer, but what do you think that the main uh, barrier or obstacle or pitfall um, that somebody might f um, face um, as they try to uh, implement this or overhaul their security? There are a couple. That's a really good question. The first question is a lot of security, maybe like I was saying in answer to Mark's question, a lot of security has been very much focused on the perimeter, right? Like how do we keep bad people from getting in. That's, that's actually a very narrow-minded way to think about security. Our number one concern, of course we don't want bad people getting in, but the number one concern is almost always the data. We don't want, we don't want the data being sent where it shouldn't, used how it shouldn't, um, accessed, shared, uh, applied in ways that it shouldn't. And the data is kind of this critical thing, but a lot of security is just focused on this perimeter concept and then like, well, security is only responsible for the perimeter and whatever happens inside is none of our business. That is, that is, that is very broken, and it, but, but there's a culture and a mindset. So part of what's important is for data people to um, get executives on board with the idea that the data is the keys of the kingdom. The data is the, the, the valuables, the crown jewels. And that the starting point is, um, the starting point is how do we protect our data? And if we start with that starting point and we, we ask our security teams to retool from that perspective, um, with an emphasis on the importance of the quality of our data, which is not something most security folks are trained in. That is where I think organizations can make, um, make a difference. Um, I see this other question, what would be your pitch statement for data security? Well, I kind of think I was already giving it. Data is probably what makes your organization its money. Uh, and, and also data is also the place where we're coming up with big fines, you know, those GDPR fines or lawsuits or, you know, all of these different things. It's, it's the data is where we'll make our money and the data is where we'll lose our money. So the starting point for our security, it's, it's, you start with the goals in mind, not the, not the implementation. The goal is to secure the data, not protect the border. It's a slight you know, it's, a, it's not that they're not related, but you start with what matters most and you work out from there. Seth, I think that's great. Uh, looks like uh, we don't have any other questions and uh, we're running up on time. So thank you so much for your presentation and thank you to our attendees for tuning in. Uh, please remember to complete your conference session survey at the bottom of this page. And the next sessions will start in about 10 minutes. Uh, also, we encourage you to check Stop by the uh, sponsor booths to get some great free resources um, if you're able to uh, find the time in the remaining of the session or this uh, conference day. Thank you so much again, Seth, and have a great day. Thanks. Email if you have questions. <laughs>